Okay, so we're going to continue going over limits. And let's just start out with a quick and easy example to remind ourselves what we were doing. How about this example? The limit as x goes to 3 of 4x squared plus 8. So what are you supposed to do here? <laughs> ah, so we sort of described this loosely, what this limit procedure is. It's sort of following the graph until you arrive at the point you want to arrive at. And sort of you, it sort of allows you to arrive at a point even if it doesn't exist there. But 4x squared plus 8 is a particular kind of function that starts with p. Okay, it's a, it, it's a parabola. Its graph is a parabola. But as a function, it is a polynomial. Okay, good. So then, what does that mean about polynomials? Do pol what does that mean about here? So polynomials are smooth everywhere, right? None of their points are missing, in a sense. You might look think of it like that. So what do you suppose we're supposed to do here? Just plug it in, right? Just plug in the value. The point... It's exactly where we hope it is going to be. So 4 times 3 squared plus 8. Okay, and then that's what? 4 times 9 is 36 plus 8 is 44? Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so then how about mm, one slightly more interesting? How about the limit as x goes to uh, 1, x goes to 1, of x squared plus x plus 2 in the numerator divided by x plus 1. So then now the function being limited is no longer a polynomial. It's not a polynomial anymore. What kind of function is that? Hmm. Starts with R. Rational, right? It's a rational function. Right, it's a rational function. Does that mean that you could, you could talk this function out of doing something unreasonable? A rational function? No, no, no. What does this mean here? What does rational mean? means ratio in this context. That's what we're talking about, ratio. So specifically, a rational function is a ratio of polynomials. So another result that you should know from pre-calculus about rational functions is rational functions are, in a sense, I'll just use a colloquial word, smooth. They're smooth everywhere except where? Where the denominator is zero. Okay, and rational functions where the denominator is zero, they have one of two graphical features. What are those features? It's either a vertical asymptote, might be a vertical asymptote, and it may also be a, a starts with H, a hole, right? For a rational function, if you have a, a zero in the denominator, graphically, that's either going to be a vertical asymptote or a hole. So then now the limit point is, is 1. So what is the denominator of this rational function at 1? It's 2, right? So then is there any problem here? No, none whatsoever. So then what are we supposed to do here? Just plug it in, right? So then we get 1 squared plus 1 plus 2 divided by 1 plus 1. Well, that's uh, what? 4 over 2 is 2? Great. So any question about this example? Okay, so how about something slightly more interesting? Okay, so for example, the limit as x goes to th uh, negative 3 of x squared plus x minus 6 and then divided by x plus 3. Okay, now again, what kind of function is this being limited? A rational function. It's a rational function. So then, now, how about at the limit point? What is the denominator? Evaluate to. Zero. Ah, so then, so then we, 
we need to do something else, right? So then we know because this is a rational function, because the denominator is zero, graphically, if we were to plot this, there would be one of two different kinds of features, either a vertical asymptote or a hole. And so we sort of are not really sure what's happening. So then the way you figure out what's happening is you consider, well, how about the numerator? How about the numerator? What does the numerator evaluate to? What does the numerator evaluate to? Zero also, right? Because negative three squared is positive nine, and then plus negative three is positive six, and then minus six is exactly zero. So then, so then, what that means is that the numerator must factor. This must be one of the factors in the numerator. And if that's one of the factors, what is the other one? Minus two, good. Okay, so then now, after that, if this limit wasn't here, right, if this limit symbol wasn't here, you could not do what thing that we want to do. You could not cancel, right, you could not cancel. But the limit is there, and the limit is telling you that we're going to get as close to negative 3 as we want, but we're not going to be at negative 3. So in a sense, the limit is protecting us from this catastrophe that's happening at negative 3. So then what that allows you to do algebraically is to say that this is equivalent to the limit as x goes to negative 3 of what thing? Just x minus 2. Okay, now, x minus 2 is a polynomial, right? That's a polynomial. So then how do you compute the limit at any point for a polynomial? You just plug in. Right, so then this will be negative 3 minus 2, which is just a fancy way to write 5. Okay, so any question about this example? Negative 5. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> negative 5. So, that, so let, let's, let's consider that for, for, <laughs> for a moment, because it was an interesting mistake, right? So then what happened? I wrote all of these very careful lines, and then at the end, I should have written negative 5, but I wrote positive 5. That kind of error, typically, the graders and myself, we don't really take off much, if anything, for that. Because what is that? That's just somehow you had a temporary glitch in your brain for a moment. Now, if you just wrote <laughs> this and then at the end wrote positive 5 and you didn't write inter any of the intervening steps, you would probably get no credit whatsoever. Similarly, if you just wrote negative 5 and you didn't write any of the intervening steps, you would not receive any credit whatsoever because this class is about showing your work. Okay. Yes? Yes. <coughs> because x is not negative 3. That's why you can perform the cancellation. Other questions? Okay, one more, and then we're going to talk more specifically about some precise details about limits. Okay. Let's consider this one, the limit as x goes to 0 of the square root in the, in the numerator, the square root of x plus 1, and then minus 1 outside of the square root over x. OK. Now this, this is not a polynomial, and this is not a rational function. Why is this not a rational function? Because there's a square root, right? That square root, a rational function is a ratio of what? Polynomials. Now, the denominator is a polynomial. The numerator is not a polynomial, okay? It has a radical in it, and therefore, it's not a polynomial. Generally, this is just called an algebraic function. So this is an algebraic expression. Now, let's consider. In the numerator, in the numerator if you were to plug in the limit point, what would you get? Zero. And in the denominator, if you were to plug in the limit point, what would you get? Also zero. OK. So something strange maybe hap is happening here. And we're not sure what, what's happening. And we want to be able to figure it out without plotting millions and billions of points. Right? So maybe we're not going to have calculators on the quizzes and exams, right? So no graphing calculators and blah, 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 blah. So you have to have some means to get at this. Well, for this particular kind of problem, what's required is you have to do silly algebraic uh, routine here. So then, much of mathematics uses the following kind of technique. 
And I'm going to make this a square bracket. Okay, so here's this, the square root of x plus 1, and then minus 1 over x. That's what it was originally. And now I'm going to multiply by 1. Right? That's certainly a legal thing to do. You can always multiply by 1. Okay, but what really comes down to the trick and the art to this is figuring out just what kind of 1 do I want to multiply by. So besides multiplying by 1, another very common thing in math is you don't multiply by 1, but you can add 0, right? So instead of choosing some clever representation of 1, you choose some clever representation of 0. So that's all we're doing here. So then now, I'll say that this is the limit as x goes to 0 of... So x plus 1 minus 1 over x, that was the original thing. And now I need to pull a rabbit out of the hat and figure out what this 1 should be. So who maybe has seen this kind of thing before knows what kind of 1 is going to go there. Right, okay, so I'm looking, this is an expression that looks like a minus b, right? a minus b. And I'm looking for a math word that starts with c. Conjugate. Right, the conjugate. So if you have an expression a minus b, what is the conjugate of a minus b? A plus b. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by the conjugate of this term divided by the conjugate of this term. So that is to say, we're going to multiply by x plus 1 plus 1 divided by the square root of x plus 1 plus 1, like so. So in this particular con... Uh, context, this is called rationalization, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to rationalize the numerator. That is to say, we want to, we want to perform this algebraic miracle here to make it to where there's no more radical in the numerator. Okay, so if we do this, if we carry this out, the limit as x goes to 0, okay, in the numerator, you get the square root of x plus we're going to foil the numerator, the square root of x plus 1 multiplied by the square root of x plus 1. You do that and you get x plus 1, like that. The square, you square the square root and the square root goes away. And then negative 1 multiplied by positive 1 is negative 1. And then, because we're multiplying conjugates, the cross terms cancel, right? You get positive square root, the positive version of the square root, and the negative version of the square root. You add them together, they go away. Okay, so then divided by x multiplied by the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Okay, now in the numerator there's some simplification possible. What simplification is that? It can just be rewritten as x by itself. So this is, this is the limit as x goes to 0 of x divided by x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1, like so. Okay, so then now we've performed a sequence of algebraic operations, and it should be clear to you now why originally it was in the form 0 over 0, right? Because there's a factor of x in the numerator, and there's a factor of x in the denominator. Now, if, if we were not computing a limit, and none of those limit symbols were there, what would you not be allowed to do? Cancel. You cannot cancel unless you have unless you can guarantee that you are away from zero and that is what the limit is doing here the limit is saying that we we can make guarantees that we are away from zero the catastrophe that is happening there so then we can cancel so this is the limit as x goes to zero of just one over the square root of x plus one plus one okay. made possible by x not equal to zero Okay, so then now consider this expression. Can you plug in the limit point now? Yes, now you can plug in the limit point, and what do you obtain? One half, right? So I'm going to plug it in, so I don't need the limit now. So then this will be 1 over the square root of 1 plus 1. The square root of 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, so this is half. Any question about this example? Okay, so then now we need to consider, again, this is what we left off with last, last time, the formal definition of limit. Okay, that is to say, 
the <coughs> epsilon delta definition of limit. Okay, so then we have a statement that looks like this. We've been, make, we've been writing this statement several times, but we need to know formally what it means. Okay, so then the statement. The limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to l, right? We've written this several times, right? We just did several examples means and I'm just going to write because I already wrote it in the previous notes in English I'm just going to write it in that symbolic notation for all epsilon greater than zero there exists delta greater than zero such that zero less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta implies that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, now, I'm fully aware that this seems like mostly a magic and possibly even illegal incantation, right? <laughs> okay, so then this is a purely ling linguistic thing. Okay, maybe from your point of view, but let's try and draw a picture. Let's try and draw a picture that describes what is happening. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm going to draw an axis. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'm going to draw a function. I'll draw it in, in green. That would be nice. Okay, so then, no, we'll make it blue. Better. Okay, so function. <coughs> oh, that's not gonna work. I need this one. Okay, so there's a function. Now this function is quite smooth. Now at this point that I'm indicating right here with my little dot, do you think that the limit exists right there? Yeah. So give me sort of a colloquial reason why it seems like the limit exists there. There's no holes, there's no oscillation, there's no asymptotes. For those of you that have taken calculus before, I know you're just, just really itching to say some word that starts with C, but we're not going to talk about that until next week. Okay, so now <clears throat> I'm going to choose a point. I'm going to choose a point about where I was indicating. And I'm going to call this point x is equal to c. <coughs> okay, so this will be the point x is equal to c. So then now, I can see from inspection with my eyes, right, I can see the y value, the y value of the graph. Oops. The y value of the graph is about this value right here. Okay, so then let's say that that happens to be y is equal to L. <coughs> and this will be the function f of x. So we have a statement that's up here, right? So what we're saying graphically is sort of, sort of looks like this. We're saying the limit, if you are on this graph, this blue graph, and you're going to x to c, Right, you're, you're, you are taking x values to be close to x is c, then your y values have to be close to y is l. Right? If you're close to x is c, you have to be close to y is l. You can't be away from it. That's what the limit is saying. So then now, this statement, right, this incantation here for all epsilon greater than zero, blah, 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 is saying this. This is part of an adversarial argument. And so what I'm going to do now is say, okay, I can draw a box. Okay, what it is is that is that I have made this claim, the limit is L. And then you say to me, well, does it work for this epsilon? So you give me some epsilon and maybe your epsilon is this much. Okay. 
Okay, so then this will be L plus epsilon, and this down here will be L minus epsilon. Okay, so this is L plus epsilon, and this is L minus epsilon. Oh, that's great, isn't it? This is L minus epsilon. So, use, it's an adversarial argument, so you've said this. I say, I say the limit is L, and then you say, well, is it within one of L? And I'll say, yes, I can make it be within one of L, so long as you are this close to C. And then you say, okay, okay, fine, it worked for one, but that, I, that wasn't strict enough. Is it within one half of L? And then I come back and say, yes, so long as I can make, I can make, is, so long as you guarantee you are this close to x is c. And then we continue this argument forever. You say, is it within one, one millionth of L? And I say, yes, yes, it's within one one millionth of L, so long as you get closer to x is c. So then this, this will be, the two values that I control. So in this argument that we're having, you have control over epsilon, right? Which means that you have control over the horizontal strip, the green strip. And then I have control over the red strip. And if no matter how skinny you make the green strip, if I can make the red, red strip correspondingly skinnier so that the entire blue graph exists within this box like this, then the limit exists. Okay, that is to say that notice, how about this, this uh, value that I'm about to draw? So this right here, this, this, will be x plus delta. And what is this value over here, do you suppose? x minus delta. All right, that should be c, right? c plus delta and c minus delta. So then now, let's, let's, uh, it's sort of illustrative to give you an example where it doesn't work. So then the delta that I've drawn works. It is an appropriate delta. So what if I drew a delta over here? Maybe I got really, uh, I said, well, I really like big deltas. I'm going to see if this one will work. So does that work? Would this delta work? Okay, the answer is no, so I want someone to tell me why the answer would be no. Because, look at, this, look at this bit of the graph. This graph is outside of, of your horizontal strip, right? I have to create a vertical strip such that all of the graph in my vertical strip lands in your horizontal strip. So the graph is up here. So this, ver this delta would not work. Oops. Okay, so then similarly, how about, how about this delta that I'll draw in pink? Would this delta work? Would it work? Yeah, it would work. It would work because I got close, but still all of the graph that's in my vertical strip falls in your horizontal strip. It's all in there. So that delta would work fine. So then can you see a variety of deltas that would and would not work? Okay, so then that is, that is what this magical statement is saying. Okay, so any questions about that? <coughs> so now I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that we're not going to ask many questions about epsilon and delta. The bad news is that we are going to ask some questions about epsilon and delta. Okay, so then let's, let's uh, go ahead and do an example. Okay. So for example, for example, these are really easy to just make up. Show that the limit as x goes to some easy place like 1 of some random quadratic or something, 4x squared plus 3x plus 8, is equal to, so what should this be equal to? 
what should it be equal to? You should be able to tell. Tell me. It should be what? 4 plus 3 is 7 plus 8 is 15? Good. So show that this is true. Show this statement with epsilon delta. So you've got to go through that computation. Okay. So I'd like to point out this computation is sort of weird and very thorough and you can use it all that you want but if I don't explicitly say that you must use epsilon and delta please don't use epsilon and delta just do it the normal way right we already if you don't have to use epsilon and delta just writing 15 is enough to solve this question but since I said you have to use epsilon and delta you have to do it this way okay oh the thing you crashed Okay, it's going to take just a second for it to... That was really aggravating, wasn't it? Okay, so let's try it again. So let's see if I can remember what random thing I wrote down. The limit as x goes to 1 of 4x squared plus what? 3x plus 8. Okay, and we said it was 15. Okay, so let's try it again. Okay, so then these always start out with, so the solution always start out starts out with the following statement. Let, let epsilon greater than 0 be given. All right, so what that's saying is that is that I'm challenging you. Right? I have I've I've said that I'm going to give you any epsilon that I wish and you say give it to me. Give me an epsilon. Okay. So then you start out with f of x minus l an absolute value. Okay. So then what is f of x in this particular problem? 4x squared plus 3x plus 8. Okay, and then minus L. What is L in this particular problem? 15. Okay, now let's <coughs> simplify this. So 4x squared plus 3x and then plus 8 minus 15 is negative 7. Okay, now what we need to do, <coughs> now what we need to do is factor that. And this is the point where you say, Oh man, I hate factoring quadratics that don't have a leading coefficient of 1. Right? That's what everyone says here. Ah, but, but, you know something. Right? So what happens if you plug in 1 into this quadratic? What do you get? 0. And what does that tell you about the, one of the factors of that quadratic? It has to be x minus 1. Right? x minus 1 has to be one of those factors. Look, the limit point is 1. So there's going to be a factor of x minus 1. If the limit point was 10, there would be a factor of x minus 10. If the limit point was negative 3, there would be a factor of x plus 3, right? So you don't have to be some wizard, some factoring wizard, right? Good. So then this, you could factor this like so, x minus 1 multiplied by 4x, right? The other factor would have to start with 4x. Okay, and this is negative 1 times something has to be negative 7, so plus, and then what? 7, right? Does everyone agree? Okay, now, how could you check that, by the way? You could FOIL it out, right? But well, I'm just going to assume that I did it right because we're in a hurry. Okay, so then now, I could rewrite this like this. I'm going to factor it like x minus 1 multiplied by 4x plus 7. Okay, now, this term that I'm going to point to, we have control over this one. The reason why we have control over that one is because we are computing the limit we're computing the limit as x goes to 1, which means that we can force the issue and say that we are as close to 1 as we wish. We can be as close to 1 as we wish, which means that we have control over x minus 1. We can make it as small as possible. 
And what we want to do is we want to say, because we have control over x minus 1, this in turn allows us to assert control on everything else. Meaning, in this particular question, you can assert control on this term. <coughs> so we need to assert control over this one. Okay, so then the control that we have is this. So I'm going to say, so we're going to assume that x minus 1 is less than 1 in absolute value. Now that number 1, that's arbitrary. Okay, it could have been anything. If my favorite number was 7, I could have said, I'm going to assume that x minus 1 is less than 7 in absolute value, because what that's saying is that we are within 7 of the limit point. We could be within 1 1 trillionth of the limit point. And all I'm saying is that we're within 1 of the limit point. Does everyone see that that's something that we can say? We can always say that. Now, if you like some other number besides 1, as long as it's positive, you can use that. Okay? But please, please just use 1 because it will simplify your life and the greater's life. Okay, since that is the case, now we can make the following sequence of operations. x minus 1 is less than 1. Well, now I want to write a new inequality where there is no more any absolute value. So how do you drop the absolute value? Ah, you take, you take the right-hand side, you rewrite it like this, x minus 1, less than 1. Now I drop the absolute value, but my statement is not correct. What do I have to do to make the statement correct? Greater than negative 1, right? That is the means to drop the absolute value. Okay, so it's between negative 1 and positive 1. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression, we're going to take this expression where we are, x minus 1, and we want to make it look like 4x plus 7. So the first thing I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is add uh, negative one, add 1 to all sides. So this is saying that 0 is less than x is less than 2. All right, so I added 1 to all positions in the inequality. So now, in the center of the inequality, I have 1x. And what I want to get to is I want to get to 4x. So what should I do? Multiply by 4. So if I multiply by 4, then I get 0 is less than 4x is less than 8. Right, I multiplied by 4. So now, I have 4x, and I want, to have, I want to have 4x plus 7. So what should I do to get 4x plus 7? Add 7, right? So then now 7 <coughs> is less than 4x plus 7 is less than 15. <coughs> that f the fact that the 15 has shown up here is a coincidence. That I'm actually kind of sorry about it. I wish it didn't show up. Okay. <coughs> so then now I'd like to ask, of the two endpoints, of the two endpoints, 7 and 15, which one is bigger in absolute value? 15, right? What if the endpoints were negative, sif negative 17 and positive 15? Which one would be bigger in absolute value? Negative 17, right? So this is the bigger one. This is the bigger one. So I can rewrite this statement. I'll say 7 is less than 4x plus 7 less than 15. And so all, all I've done currently is I've copied it, but now I'm going to say something that's entirely obvious. Greater than negative 15. Okay, but the reason why I wrote that, the reason why I wrote that is because now I can say that negative 15 is less than 4x plus 7 is less than 15. And what does that tell me? Now I can, I can turn this into one inequality, right? This is three inequalities. I can turn it into one inequality by reintroducing what? The absolute value. So now I can say the absolute value of 4x plus 7 is less than... 15. And I want to impress upon you that this is exactly what we were trying to do. Right? We were considering this limit. We were considering that limit, and we said we factored it into these two terms, and we had control over x minus 1, and we wanted to use this to assert control over 4x plus 7, and we have just done it. 
We have said, I have control. I can guarantee that I am within one. Right? I, can, I can make this less than one. And if I do that, if I do that, then the other term is less than 15. That's the control. I have now asserted it. Okay, so now I can do the following. So I'm going to take delta is equal to the smaller of 1 and epsilon over 15. So now the epsilon, that's what I gave you. And I, I gave you the epsilon. Remember, this is an adversarial argument. You've made the claim to me that the limit is 15. And then, <coughs> and then I say, well, is it within one-tenth of 15? And then you, you are saying, yes, so long as you choose delta according to this. Okay, now, where did each of these pieces come from? Okay, so then here, here, is a one. This is a choice, right? This could have been any positive number. But please always choose one. Okay, it will make your life easier. This one is where, is where this came from. Okay, now, unfortunately, just to, due to random chance, 15 has showed up twice in this problem. <laughs> it's just a coincidence. Now, this epsilon over 15, where did the 15 come from? It came from this 15. Right? This 15 right here. This 15. is that 15. Just as a coincidence, purely by coincidence, there was another 15 in this problem. Okay. So this right here, this is the answer to the question. Delta is equal to the minimum of, of these two. Now let's see why this is the case. Why this gives us the answer. So then if we take 0 as less than x minus 1, is less than delta. Well, this implies first that x minus 1 is less than delta, just dropping part of that inequality. And delta is equal to the minimum <coughs> of 1 and epsilon over 15. Now it's equal to the smaller, whichever, it's equal to the, small, the smaller of them. So then that means that x minus 1 is less than delta and that's less than or equal to epsilon over 15 because delta couldn't possibly be bigger than epsilon over 15 because we already made that choice. Okay, so what that is saying is that we could say that x minus 1 is less than epsilon over 15. Now I can take the 15 and multiply both sides by 15 and obtain that x minus 1 multiplied by 15 is less than epsilon. Now, do you know anything that's less than 15? Anything maybe in this problem that we're dealing with that's less than 15? Right there at the top of the screen? 4x plus 7. 4x plus 7 is less than 15. So, then we can say, well, x minus 1 multiplied by the absolute value of 4x plus 7, well, that's less than x minus 1 multiplied by 15, which is less than epsilon. Okay, so then this term is less than that term because these two first terms are the same and this one is less than that one. Okay, so then now what this is saying is that x minus 1 multiplied by 4x plus 7 is less than epsilon, but now I can multiply these two together. Right? I could say that this is x minus 1 multiplied by 4x plus 7 is less than, eps is less than epsilon. It's less than epsilon. Okay, so then now if I multiply these two together, what do you suppose I get? The original, the original equation. So then I get f of x minus L is less than epsilon, which is what we wanted to show, right? So what it was is you made this claim to me. You said the limit is 15. 
okay? And the machinery we have to, to, to do this limit is the epsilon delta thing. So it's, a, it's an adversarial argument. You say to me, well, I, I claim the limit is 15. And then I say, is it within 1 tenth? And you say, yes, so long as delta satisfies that it is the minimum of 1 and 1 tenth divided by 15. And then I say, well, is it within 1, one millionth? And then you come back and you say, yes, so long as blah, 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 blah. And because this argument can continue indefinitely, we agree that the limit is 15. Okay. So then now, like I said, this is a seemingly a long and drawn out process. Okay, but this is what you must do to receive credit on this question. Okay, so that's the bad news. The good news is we're not going to ask so many of these questions. Okay. So then now, this is one of the very few places where you see a math argument. So then typically people, when <laughs> seeing a math argument or reading a math argument, a lot of times they fall asleep or whatever and can't figure out <laughs> where the end is. So then it is, mathematic, it is the, the uh, practice of mathematicians to write a big black box at the end, which is, in, which is called a tombstone. <laughs> okay, so then the argument has been put to rest. So that's, that's so when you're reading through these things, you can tell, oh, that's, that's where it ended. <laughs> Just so you can scan through and skip, skip over all of it. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, good. Now we need to talk about something called the squeeze theorem. Okay. And it is this. If f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x. So this is the first requirement. And 2. The limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to L and the limit as x goes to C of h of x is equal to L then we can make a definitive conclusion then what? is L, right? So then now, look at this Look at this inequality. I have G squeezed. It's squeezed between F and G. Right? It has to be greater than or equal to F. It has to be less than or equal to G. There's no other possibility. Okay? And then what I'm saying is that now, let, as we're going to see, F goes to L. So that means that G must be greater than or equal to L, right? as you're going to see. Okay, similarly, as you're going to see, H goes to L. So both of the endpoints of that inequality are going to L. So there is no other possibility for G than for it also to go to L. Okay, so then the conclusion is the limit as X goes to C of G of X is L. So the reason why it's called the squeeze theorem is because G is... Oh, this thing is killing me. Because G is squeezed between <coughs> F of X and H of X. <sighs> well, maybe we'll just use the paper next time. Okay, so then now we need to do an example of this. Okay, so then the example that we're going to do is going to first be given by a remark. And these are special trig limits. So these are limits that you must memorize. Okay, there are two of them. The limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x divided by x. So first off, what is sine? when you evaluate at zero? Not one. Zero, right? The sine of zero is zero. 
okay and then this is zero so then at the limit this is zero over zero right so there's no telling what this is equal to but I can tell you right now that it's equal to one okay this is something you must memorize okay similarly there is one involving cosine and it is the limit as x goes to zero of one minus the cosine of x over x is equal to okay so then what is cosine at zero it's one so then what does the numerator evaluate to at zero zero and then divided by zero so this is in the form zero over zero what does this one evaluate to not one zero <laughs> this one evaluates to zero okay good okay so any question about this one okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate we're going to demonstrate the first one okay and the second one you have to do in uh, the take-home quiz wonderful okay so let's show the sign one okay oh. right here so then what we're going to do is I'm going to draw this by freehand since I don't have enough time to do it all with the nice shapes. <coughs> okay, so then here's an axis, and here's a circle, hopefully. Pretty good circle. So then now, this in particular is the unit circle. So then now I'll choose a point, which is on the circle. Okay, so then now I can draw from the origin through that point. Okay, and then from this position over here, you can draw this. Okay, and then from, from, I need another color here. How about orange? No, that looks too similar. Orange? We'll do orange. From here to here. Okay, now, and I'll indicate this. So then now, this dashed orange line, the dashed orange line, what is the height if I call this angle theta? What is the height of the dashed orange line? It is the sine of theta. Right, because this coordinate right here, that coordinate is the cosine of theta. That's the x coordinate. What's the y coordinate? The sine of theta. Okay, so the length of the dashed orange line is sine of theta. So then, now, there's a triangle right here, right? So then the red line, the orange line, and the black line, right? So then I'm tracing it out with the, with the dot. There's a triangle here okay its height is sine of theta what is its width one right because that is the circle the unit circle the circle of radius one so then this is a triangle now here's a triangle and then this triangle is actually inside of another shape called a sector what would you say about the area of the triangle versus the area of the sector is the area of the sector bigger or smaller bigger right because the sector has all of the triangle area plus this little sliver and then there's a triangle which contains both of them which is the red side and the green side and the black side now that triangle contains all of them so that of the three shapes that I've talked about the biggest triangle the sector which is contained in it and the triangle contained in it you can see that their areas are strictly decreasing Okay, now, the last thing is this, is what is the height of the green side? This is another trigonometric identity. I'll just break the news to you. That's the tangent of theta, <laughs> since we're in a hurry here. <coughs> okay, so then now, what this is telling you is that, is that the tangent of theta, right, the height of the big triangle, multiplied by the base of the big triangle divided by 2 right that's greater than or equal to greater than or equal to that sector so the sector the sector is <coughs> what who knows 
it will be theta times the radius squared over 2, right? That's the area of that sector. Okay, and this is greater than or equal to the interior triangle. So the height of that triangle is the sine of theta multiplied by base, which is 1, and then divided by 2. So the triangle, the triangle, and the sector, and the smaller triangle are ordered by this. So now I can perform some algebraic simplification. So then I'll multiply everything by 2, and the division by 2's go away. So then the leftmost one will be sine of theta over cosine of theta, because that's the definition of tangent, is greater than or equal to theta, is greater than or equal to sine of theta. Okay, now I'm going to divide everything by sine of theta and say that 1 over the cosine of theta is greater than or equal to theta over sine of theta is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, and this is assuming, this is assuming that the angle that I have is in the first quadrant. Okay, because if it, wa if it was in the, third, in the fourth quadrant, then I would have had to change the direction of the inequality because the sine of theta would have been negative. So now I'm going to invert every term in this inequality. What happens when you compute reciprocals with inequalities? They, that's correct. They switch directions. So this is the cosine of theta is less than or equal to the sine of theta. And we're almost done here. Over theta is theta is less than or equal to what's the reciprocal of 1? One. 1. So now, now, this is a setup for the squeeze theorem, this last line. So look at what it's saying. It's saying that the cosine of theta is on the left side, and 1 is on the right side. And sine of theta over theta has to be in between those two things. So now, look, the limit as theta goes to 0 of the cosine of theta, well, that has to be less than or equal to the limit as theta goes to 0 of the sine of theta over theta, which is what I wanted, right? I want to figure that one out. And that has to be less than or equal to the limit as theta goes to 0 of 1. So then now tell me, let's do the right one first. What does 1 do as theta goes to 0? What does 1 do when it's sunny outside? <laughs> it's always 1, right? That's one of the most outstanding things about 1. So then how about cosine? What does it do as theta goes to 0? It goes to 1. So what do I have? I have said that the limit as theta goes to 0 of the sine of theta over theta has to be greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 1. So there's only one possibility, and what possibility is that? It's exactly equal to 1. Okay, so then that is all I had for today. Have a good weekend.